There's a place in the Ozark Mountains where the views seemingly go on forever, where the trees shade the roads and the swimming holes are cool and deep. A place where you can float the river, rent a cabin, and quaint country stores wait to greet their customers. Boxley Valley has a strong sense of community and history. I've spent the last 30 years photographing, documenting, and now videoing old water mills. Each one has a story to tell. We're in Northwest Arkansas today on the banks of the beautiful Buffalo National River right here in Newton County. Hi, I'm Jim Debrock and this is Boxley Mill. Let's take a look around. History and a little bit of folklore are the topics of the day as I meet up with my new friend and local historian, Kevin Middleton. Okay, before we actually go into the mill, I want to talk a little bit about who built this mill. Um, a man named Robert Leva Lines. Uh, this was his property, um, and there had been a mill here previously. Actually, there had been two mills right in this area. We don't quite know where they were, but right around here. But after the Civil War, I'm sure he wanted to get back home and get on with life. And I'm sure there was a demand for a mill. And um, he was a forward-thinking man to build something this big for those times because so many of the people had already left. But anyway, in 1869, Robert Lee Lyons decided, I'm going to build this mill. He hired a man, um, oddly named Miller, to build it. That was just his name. Um, and they built it from just trees and materials uh, right around here. You see rocks as the foundation. They would have found those right here. The, the, all the main logs um, in this post and beam building, were, I'm sure they cut just right here. So they had the tools and the skills, but it was all done by hand. It was done by saws and axes and, and, and things like that. They had mules to help them. It operated originally from about 1870 to 1900 in the old form, and then he upgraded it and for the rest of its life from about 1901 to about 1950, it was high tech, at least early on for its time. So I think that's really an interesting thing. It goes back to this is the community. This is more than just a, a mill that uh, did business. It, it is a place where people lived and died and had families. And that's what, to me, this is all about. So, right. Now you mentioned some huge hand-hewn logs. Let's go inside. Yeah, and take a look. let's go look. When I come into this building, I want to talk about the building itself, and I like to look, point to this corner. And this is a post and beam building. They built these this out of logs, trees that were here, and they built it with hand tools. They built it with saws and axes and they put it together with wooden pegs as you can see in this corner post over here there's there's a peg coming through it on both sides and that's what joined it together not nails or bolts or screws wooden pegs that they would just use um, the materials they had at hand and then you can see the different ways they supported it there's a wooden peg on both of those beams there's wooden pegs up here and you look at the floor joists up above, and you see axe marks on all of them. First, they cut the tree probably with a cross-cut saw, and then they shaped these, and you can see each of the axe marks as they shaped them. And every one of these pieces of this building were done that way. And one of the first things I noticed when I came in here, especially the very first time, and I saw this big, big beam that runs the length of the building, and later I, I, I had questions about it, and I learned that uh, they tell me it was an oak tree, so it's made out of oak. And you can see the axe marks. And it's pretty darn square. Somebody with a lot of skill was able to take a round tree and turn it into this beautiful beam that holds this whole building together. It's 40-some-odd feet. And then, you know, these posts that come up uh, from the ground and they, they fashioned this other piece to go together. You can see the wooden peg, and it looks like there's pegs going up into it also. 
strong, strong, strong. It's been kept dry all these years, and it's still probably about as strong as it was when it was put in place in 1869. The old road, main road, was right here in front of the mill. And if you can imagine, wagon after wagon, horses and mules lined up. Families sent their children with a sack of corn. So they would just grind one sack of corn and then they'd return it as corn meal. We're back in the back of the mill to one of the original features. One of the reasons, the main reason this was built was to grind grain. And these millstones are what did it originally before they had roller mills or anything else. They had these millstones. Um, these millstones came from France. If you can imagine in 1869, that had to be quite a journey. I don't know, we talked earlier, to imagine how these got here. Um, came across the ocean, had to come into one of the major ports probably. Could have come up the Mississippi River, the White River, the Arkansas River, I don't know. But they came here and they were transported here by wagon and, and were in operation by 1870. So these are the original millstones. They did a great job at grinding corn, not quite as good at grinding wheat, but they could do it. The grain was poured in this hopper. It would go down in there. One of the millstones was, uh, did not move and one moved. And there's a belt that turned the whole thing underneath. And we can, might be able to see that later. if We get to go under there. So, and then there were um, different patterns of grooves and furrows, uh, depending on what the miller chose that would grind the, the grain into meal, and then it would allow it to work its way out and drop in a bin underneath. So as it ground the grain, I'll stick with corn, the cornmeal would drop into a bin and, and they'd fill up a bin underneath full of the, the cornmeal. So that's how the whole process worked. It worked well. Um, it was an old, fairly old technology, but new to this area when it was built. Um, and these are the original stones as far as we know. One thing I like to talk about when I'm here, we talked earlier about men using tools to build this place. And here's a pulley, um, handmade, I'm sure, if you look at it. Once again, men with lots of skill built this. And occasionally those stones would have to be pulled up and regrooved. Um, some, sometimes the, the miller would do it himself. Sometimes he'd have a skilled person that did it but they had to recut the grooves with um, metal tools. I, I, I'd, I'd love it. I'd love to get this thing in operating condition, but I don't think that'll ever happen. So you can imagine all the people gathering. I, I know for a fact that three of the Valines children found their spouses here when they were young. I've heard of two other cases of young people um, getting together and then later being married. Uh, people think a lot in the old times about churches and schools, and there were churches and schools in the area. Uh, I can imagine the men talked politics. Um, they talked uh, about their crops. They talked about the weather. But this was a meeting place that was kind of the center of, of what we now call the Boxley community. and. Um, and it wasn't just a place of work. It wasn't just what we now think of, you know, a, a mill. It was way, way more than that. Okay, what we have right here would not have been original to the mill. We know it was brought in um, by, by um, James Valine, James Larkin Valines, the second operator. He brought two of these in in 1901. Um, he sold one at some point. He wasn't using it, so he sold it. But they were identical, according to him. And they would have been brought in by wagon, which just amazes me. This is, this is iron. Um, but it, they got it here. And they used these for uh, wheat, mostly. And you can see inside, it's got these big rollers, steel rollers, um, that they could adjust the gap between them and make fine or coarse uh, flour out of those. And that was something you couldn't really do with the original grindstones. So it was a big improvement. But basically you'd pour wheat that you'd grown in the top, adjusted how you wanted to, 
if you wanted to further process that flour, which apparently they usually did, it would then go upstairs and uh, to be sifted. The machines they called bolters, but what they really did was sift the flour and make a finer product. And we'll get to see those in a little bit. But this is what actually ground the flour ready to be sifted and sorted and turned into the exact same kind of white flour we'd have today. Mm -hmm. One thing I like to talk about when we're right here, we were just talking about grinding corn, it dropping down below, and there are big bins like some of these under the floor. Um, but they had to get it back up here one way or another. Some of it had to be processed. Some of it was ready to be put in a bag. But how did they get it up? And they had these fancy things called elevators. Not what most people think of. They're elevators were these straps with little cups on it. Once again, uh, one of the main power wheels would power these, and that did a fine job of bringing the product back here wherever they needed it. Some things, they might just use something like this uh, to, to bag it up. Pretty simple, but it would work. Some things um, would go upstairs and be further processed, and then they'd come down in one of these chutes, either to be put in a bin or a bag. But then when they came up the elevators, they had a purpose. And each one of these would say which machine it was going to. And we'll get to go upstairs in a minute and see some of those machines. As we move to the upper floors, having closed around 1950, it becomes clear the years have not been kind to the old mill. From the time the building was first constructed, the mill was powered by a water wheel. Then in 1900, the mill was upgraded to a turbine, which provided enough additional horsepower to run the new roller mills and a sawmill. It wasn't uncommon for entire communities to pop up around these mills and other things for people to do while they were here. Tell me about what's going on here. Uh, these are little fishing cabins and Clyde and Nellie Valines who lived here and Clyde was the last owner of the mill um, built these in the 1940s and people came. It was the first tourist attraction in Boxley Valley in Newton County basically. They came here to fish and uh, there were four of these little cabins. This one is set up uh, very much like it would have been at that time. Uh, there, there's a trough over there where they clean their fish. People would stay in the cabins or they would camp in the yard here. Ultimately, there were four cabins, a bathhouse, and a main house constructed here. Soon the entire area would become a summertime favorite recreation destination. Today, tens of thousands of river goers enjoy the Buffalo National River annually. Boxley Mill has been the center point of growth in this area since 1870. Mills like this have been the center of economic growth for the areas in which they serve. Each one is a unique treasure. I'm Jim V. Brock. Let's go find another mill to explore. Wow.